Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Cameras and Coffee. And today we're going to be talking about an interesting blog post by the guys over at Lens Rentals. And if you've never read the Lens Rentals blog, it's one of the most interesting and informative photography blogs out there. Basically, Lens Rentals has a huge supply of cameras that they rent out. Obviously, that's their business. And so they'll do tests on them and things like that and do some interesting data analysis from time to time. In this blog, which is linked in the video description, so if you haven't read it, by all means, pause the video, open up the blog in a new tab, re read through it, and then we'll come back and be on the same page. They tested a series of video cameras. And let's see, nope, that's brown sugar butter cookies. Here we go. Okay. <clears throat> the blog title is The Great Flange Distance to Sensor, the, the Great Flange to Sensor Distance Article, colon, Part One Cine Cameras. Uh, let's see. So, part two, we'll talk about what I hope to see in part two, which as of the recording this, of this video has not been posted yet. But basically the, what they did was they took a series of cinema, cinema cameras, video cameras. Uh, these are very high-end cameras. So what they did was they took a series of cinema cameras, of specialized video cameras, high-end, and they bought a special tool that is used to, to uh, cap measure the flange to sensor distance to a one hundredth of a millimeter. So that's very precise. The manufacturing tolerance for uh, any sort of camera like this is about a hundredth of a millimeter. And that is, in rough numbers, the distance and the thicknesses between the layers of film emulsions, uh, if I recall correctly. And so it's also about uh, I think it's about or maybe a little bit more than the, the difference in focus points between the three primary colors after they pass through a camera lens. Because uh, if, if you didn't know this, when a, a camera lens works basically like a prism, and if you hold a prism up to the sunlight, <clears throat> sunlight will hit it, and then it's refracted and split and a rainbow comes out of it just like that Pink Floyd album cover, right? So a lens works basically the same way. Whereas a prism spreads the light to create that rainbow, lenses focus it, but they still bend and refract that light and cause it to spread out. So red, green, and blue have different focus points once focus is achieved with a lens, even with great lenses. Um, and this is why back in the 50s, for instance, it was a major thing to have a color corrected lens because color corrected lenses did a better job at focusing the three spectra, the three primary colors than did non-color corrected lenses of similar designs that were a few years older so that people with color film would have better focus on their images than they would if they used a non-color corrected uh, lens. So they bought this device which measures to within a hundredth of a millimeter and then they plotted it and they found that there were some outliers but that this still was a large range of high-end very high-end cameras in terms of how close they were to meeting actual spec some were spot on some were off by a bit a couple of them were off by enough that they had to go in for specialized service to be brought back to specification and so they, they talk about some of these in the, the blog, but their, their methodology and their findings are really interesting. And scroll, keep, keep scrolling here. Um, the, one of the things that really goes to illustrate is that there's a huge gap between what's designed in a computer and what's produced with a machine. And the manufacturing tolerances, which if you've ever read about lens reviews in general and things like that, manufacturing tolerances can give 
very significant differences in um, results. You can get a dozen different lenses off the same factory line in the same day, and they can perform a dozen different ways because the manufacturing tolerances are not tight enough that um, they'll, they're all perfect. And the other thing of that, it, it, manufacturing tolerances have gotten much better, don't get me wrong. But um, at any rate, so, so that's also why a lot of older film cameras had shims and things like that installed in them. So after the camera was made, the technician would sit down and then they would install shims in the um, prism to line it up correctly and to get proper focus and proper magnification and frame coverage and to center the frame coverage, of course. And then there are sometimes shims in the lens mount so that the flange is placed correctly to get as close to or on tolerance, uh, on specification as possible for lens use. So I've, I have seen it in some cameras when I've had to take them apart to do repairs where there are flanges or different numbers of flanges behind the lens mount versus uh, um, some other cameras. I see it, I've seen it more with prisms where I remember taking three or four models of the same camera apart and they all had different numbers of shims underneath the prism um, than each other. So at any rate, uh, and they're all very, very thin metal shims, like super, super, skin, super thin. So in the, in the article, they're talking basically about manufacturing differences for cameras that can't be modified with shims. One of the really interesting things that they talk about in here is how a very small difference of just a couple hundreds, hundredths of a millimeter can make a wide angle lens no longer focus at infinity or can make it focus way past infinity, for instance. And that's very, very small. So I know on this channel in the past, a handful of people have said, you can run 120 film through a 220 camera or camera back without an issue. The 120 paper backing is not thick enough to throw off the focus distance. Well, that's wrong. And that's one of the things that this implies is that that, that thickness of something like 120 paper is enough to throw off that focus point because it's more than a couple hundredths of a millimeter thick. So that's how tightly these things are manufactured and that's how good the designs are that they're done to within a hundredth of a millimeter. So the charts in here that they have are incredibly interesting showing the difference, the range of camera manufacturing tolerances that they experienced uh, in testing. So they're going to do a part two. This one, part one, is just about cinema cameras. And they're going to do a part two, which is going to be about SLRs. So like I said, as of this video's recording, it's not live yet. I checked just before I signed on here. And what I'm hoping is that, so, so what do I expect to have them find? I expect that there will be a range similar to or greater than this for DSLRs in terms of how well the flange to sensor distance meets specification. That's my guess. If they test entry versus mid versus advanced versus professional cameras, I suspect that the professional cameras will have the least uh, variation and the entry cameras will have the greatest. Now, anecdotally, I have had lenses that I've used on multiple cameras with the same mount by the same maker. Generally, we're talking about things like Pentax MX, LX, K1000, K2, things like that, K1, K3. And so I've used the same lenses across many, many camera bodies and have seen variations in performance where some lenses work really, really well on one or two camera bodies and just tank it on the rest. And in general, uh, the ones that they tank it on don't perform as well with most lenses, but some lenses work really well on those cameras and not on the others. So it's, there's variation clearly within 
how well camera bodies are built to spec in terms of flange to sensor distance, but there's also going to be variation within lenses. So uh, at any rate, separate subject. The, um, so I'm hoping that they look at a range of cameras and that my suspicion is that the cheaper cameras will have the greatest variation. Uh, the other thing is I would be interested to see if there's a variation, if there's, there's a greater variation with plastic flanged cameras versus metal flanged cameras. So um, the, the, the cameras that have a plastic lens mount instead of metal, my suspicion is that those either wear or just are not built quite to spec in the first place as regularly and would have um, greater variation. Another thing I'd be interested in knowing is it would be nice if they took one of their cameras and measured it when it was indoors at, after sitting in, inside overnight. And then if they left it on the windowsill in the sun for six hours or something like that and let it get really warm and then retested it, how much would the um, heating from the sunlight affect the metal or plastic in the camera causing it to to swell so that um, to see if that throws off the sensor distance as well. That would be an interesting test for them to perform. And um, lastly, what I didn't get from this and I don't think they addressed in here was whether or not the um, flange, the, the tool they bought can measure whether or not the flanges are flat. So another potential issue with flanges is not just whether or not they are to spec this way, but also whether they're to spec on other axes, right? So if you have a, a lens you mount and it's slightly tilted, even if it's only one, if it's tilted one one hundredth of a millimeter, that means that it could be out of spec in different directions and the top and the bottom or from side or diagonal, things like that. I don't know if the tool they have can test that or not but it'd be interesting to see if they, if they could rotate that tool, whether or not it would be able to determine whether or not the flanges are perfectly parallel with the film sensor. So at any rate, I'm gonna keep my eyes open for part two of this. And when they release it, we'll come back and see what they have to say and what kind of interesting findings they get from testing some of the SLRs. So that is really it for today. It's been pretty quiet in the camera world this last week. That's why we only had one video last week. There just wasn't a huge amount to talk about. So, but this week I am hopeful that there'll be a lot more to talk about and be back on Wednesday and we'll see you for more cameras and coffee.